Good morning and happy Mother's Day. I, I know some of you maybe had expected to, you know, be dressed up nice and, and, and be in a nice place for lunch today. And well, well, that's probably not going to happen. Maybe still eating out, but at a less fancy place, but still a place where you're eating out. And so mom doesn't have to do the cooking. Unfortunately, because of these unique times we're in, and hopefully you're getting something more like this where dad's put on the apron and is doing the cooking today. Or possibly wearing something like this, you know, out, out at your grill. That's kind of the things that will probably happen rather than what we originally thought a couple months ago may happen. After a brief tour of maybe a couple of restaurants and the kitchen and the grill, we're, we're back here in the office. And some of you may have noticed that back in the office, I've, I've got a hat on. You notice that I'm wearing a hat. And it may give some of you a problem because, well, it's, it's Sunday and, you know, guys aren't supposed to wear a hat. And, well, technically it's Wednesday. I'm in my office and it's Wednesday and Hannah's up here helping me record this. But if we wanted to get picky about it, Really, it, it's not wrong scripturally to wear a hat for a guy unless you say women have to have their heads covered, but we're not going to get into that today. We can maybe do that another time if we want to talk about that, but for now I want to talk about this hat. This is a special hat. I don't know if you can see it. I'm going to step a little closer there. Hopefully you can see it. A good friend gave me this. All right, And it professes basically that I follow God. That, that's what that hat says. And we have different hats that profess different things. I could take this hat off and I could put on my, my hat here. And what does this say? This says I'm a supporter of the University of Michigan. Yep. Or I could take that hat off and I could, I could put this hat on. And what this hat says is I'm a supporter of Menards. Well, yeah, that's, that's part of it. But the other part of it is it's kind of my work hat. If I get up in the morning and just put a hat on to go work in the yard or something, that's the hat I wear. I have had over the years probably over a hundred different baseball caps. When I worked at the Speedway, we would get one, two, three, sometimes four or five each race. Four races a year, you do the math, I worked there seven years. So I used to wear hats more than I do now, but, but hats have been quite a thing for me and, and I've got quite a collection of hats. If you want to look here on my shelves, I've got a construction hat here. And I don't know if you can see way up top. You can see this one here. This is THC. That's Timothy Hills Christian, Christian Boys Ranch. It's out in Long Island in New York. And I took a group of students out there. Here we've got my grandfather's fedora, which I just think is so cool. Different hats here that remind me of different things. These here Four of these were bought on a fun vacation we had down to Myrtle Beach with the whole family a few years ago. Up over here we have, well, this, this, let's see, which one is here? Yeah, I think this one was the original special events hat. When I was in campus ministry, anytime we had a special event, the special events hat came out. Now, what's kind of cool about it is if you look inside, it says, Styled in Australia. I thought that was pretty cool. So I look a little closer and over here it says uh, made in China. Oh well, you get what you get. But hats, 
they tell a lot about us. And, and it's appropriate to talk about hats on this day of Mother's Day because it's kind of one of the days that moms will sometimes wear different hats. They bring out a fancy hat, they, they hat they like, whatever. It's one of those days that it comes out. But more than that, it's the wide variety of hats that a mom wears. She wears the mom hat at times. Sometimes it's the wife hat. She could wear the sister hat. Maybe at work she wears the boss hat or the employee hat. Could be she's the breadwinner and wears that hat. She's always a good friend and she's wearing that hat at times. Maybe it's the daughter hat. Maybe it's a comforter hat to her kids or her family. Or maybe if little Joey is not doing what he's supposed to, it's a disciplinarian hat. Regardless, there's all kinds of hats, a wide variety of hats that mom wears. Well, we all wear different hats for different reasons. And what I want to talk about today is really not hats, but what is under the hat. You know, we, we have hats that cover us for good reasons. Maybe they, they make us look good. On a sunny day, we maybe keep the sun out of our face. On reverse that, a rainy day, it may keep the rain out of our face. Maybe it is a bad hair day, like when you wake up looking like this. Maybe it's that receding hairline that you just got to wear a baseball cap over just to keep it from looking too bad. The hats are important, but what I want to do is look at what's under the hat. In the hat here from my friend, one way, Jesus, the only way, John 14, 6, I love Jesus. It professes what? It professes that I'm a Christian. The only problem is, is sometimes what's under the hat isn't what the hat professes in our lives. See, we, we claim to be followers. And this would claim that I'm a follower of Christ. But today I don't want to use the word Christian. I want to use the word disciple. See, the word Christian kind of gets watered down. And it, to me, it's less impactful. All right? The word Christian is only used three times in the New Testament. But we use it all the time. We have Christian shirts. We have Christian hats. I have one of those. We listen to Christian music. Maybe it's a Christian necklace we wear. Maybe it's a Christian bumper sticker. There's all kinds of things. But as I said, it's only used three times in the New Testament. I want to look at one of those three places just to kind of set up why I like using the word disciple. If you go to Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11, this is down in Antioch, I want to read verses 25 and 26. It says, Then Paul, or excuse me, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught a great number of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. It's the same. Either word can be used. It's interesting, though, that in the New Testament, Christian is used three times. Disciple, disciples along that line, is used 382 times. And 354 of them are in the Gospels. It seems like that is what Jesus talked about. Is that's what we were called to be. We we're called to be more than just a Christian. Well, we are just Christians. But more than just a name, we are called to be committed. And so I like the term disciple. So when I look under the hat, I want to look at three aspects. Three aspects of being a disciple. The first aspect is sanctify. Oh, well, that's one of those religious words. But we need to realize what it's all about. And when we realize what it's all about, that sanctified is the right word to use. It's not just about attending. It's not about attending with a particular group. But it's what happens when you commit your life to Christ. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 9. Or don't you know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, or adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, the greedy, or drunkards, nor slanderers, or swindlers will enter the kingdom of God. I want to stop right there for a moment. 
Those are some bad sins. Yeah, and, and you know, maybe I don't do any of those. You know, and, and we have a tendency to categorize what sins are worse than others. Well, hold that spot and go over to Galatians chapter 5 real quick. Galatians chapter 5, I want to read there, starting in verse 19. Galatians 5, 19. It says, The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, yeah, there's some bad things here. Debauchery, orgies, witchcraft. Yeah, we, those are bad sins, but, well, you know, a little rage isn't all that bad, is it? M maybe, maybe jealousy? No, no, I wouldn't classify jealousy as as much of a sin. Well, what about selflessness or selfishness, as it says here? Well, that, I, I, that's not so bad. And see, we categorize sins. We put them in the order of what we think is worse and not worse. And from a human standpoint, we should. If I tell a lie, that is not as bad as I murder someone. But either one of them will keep me out of heaven. And that's an important thing we need to realize. Okay, let's go back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Finishing up here, it says... And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. We were washed. We were bathed in the blood of Jesus. Sin sticks to us no more. I, I, I'm not necessarily a, a great cook. I do like to experiment in the kitchen and and I have been known to make a mess. My latest creation was this. I made biscuits one night, and so I made a little extra special large one. I have some sausage I'd cooked up, and I chopped that up, and then I, I scrambled an egg and put it in a pan, and, and I put the sausage in there, then cut the biscuit in half, and oh, oh, it was good. Well, in my cooking and stuff, my latest cookware that I like is the copper stuff. Things just slide right out of it. When I made that egg for that, I could just slide it right out onto that biscuit. I really like the copper cookware. And, and that's what I think of when I think of our sins and we've been washed. Those sins just slide right off us. See, the blood of Christ, once it covers us, once we've committed our life to Him and been immersed in that water, sins just slide right off us like the egg slid off that copper cookware. In, in this passage, it also talks about being justified. That means rendered righteous. We are made right with God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. I'm going to read that real quick. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 tells us that, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. I like that. We're no longer foreigners, strangers, aliens. We are members of God's household. Let me say that again. Let that think in. Members of God's household. That's pretty cool. See, we are made right through the blood of Christ that he shed when he went to that cross and died that horrific death for me, for you. The, the passage also talks about being sanctified. And I'm into that already, rendered or made right. See, we are lost without the saving grace of God, without the love poured out by him through his son on that cross. See, we are sanctified, set aside, Devoted for being a people of God. Devoted to be God. Sanctified means someone dedicated, who has dedicated their life to God. Next point I want to go to is a disciple is selfless. That's hard for many of us on many levels. I want what I want. Okay? I want this. I like that. I prefer this. I, I, I. I. You've seen in the past, I had the little statue that I, me, my is our God. 
See, that's hard. It's hard because of others. They, they may want different things than I do. They, they may want something here or, or this way, and that's not what I want. See, it's really hard to be selfless. Plus, if you're a planner, I mentioned how much of a planner I am last week, and, and I get a plan, and if that doesn't go well, I'm not happy. See, it's not thinking of others. We've got to be selfless. We need to die to self. Matthew talks about it. Mark talks about it. Luke talks about it. They all say similar things, though, different situations. I want to go to the one in Luke. In Luke chapter 9, I want to read verses 23 and 24. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whatever loses his life for me will save it. If you want to save your life, you got to lose it. you got to give it up. The difficulty in that is self. I think I've mentioned before over in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it talks about we're living sacrifices. You know the problem with a living sacrifice? It still, every day, continually wants to get up and crawl off the altar. See, if the sacrifice is dead, it lays there. If it's alive, it wants to get back. That's the difficulty. It is hard for us to be living sacrifices. But we need to use God's love to motivate us. See, it, it used to be that I wanted to be recognized for what I did. If I did something, people needed to know it because I need to be recognized. I was very mature. I have grown through that. Do I still struggle with it? Yeah. But I want to read a passage that struck me that turned my life around on needing to be recognized. It's over in John chapter 3. It's verse 30. Here we have John the Baptist, who has been preaching, who has been baptizing people. And in verse 30, his apostles, his followers have come to him and said, Hey, you know, everybody's going over to Jesus, and he's baptizing more. Very simply, John says, He must become greater. I must become less. John didn't need the credit. See, we want credit for what we do. Really, we don't need credit. We don't get the credit, but we need to make sure the glory goes to God. See, self wants credit. As a disciple, we need to make sure the glory goes to God. Back to that verse in Luke 9. Just before that verse, Jesus says that he's going to suffer. And he's going to die. Just before he tells them they need to be selfless, Jesus tells them how he is going to give himself for them. Finally, the last point I want to make is a disciple is a slave. Slave, servant, I, I kind of went back and forth on which one I should use. As you notice, they both start with this, so I'm, I'm good either way. But again, slaves seem to be the stronger of the two words. I, I researched through different translations. Some translations say servant, some say Slave. Same word. Same Greek word in both of them. I want to make sure, though, that I'm considerate of those because of our history. And we've always got to be aware of that in the U.S. history and the world's history of, of slavery. And, and I don't want to diminish that at all. But one of the things of why I chose the word slave over servant is a slave was not allowed to walk away. You want proof of that from here in our country? Look at the uh, basements in some of the older houses here, part of the Underground Railroad. I had a friend growing up in, back in Addison that the house, their farmhouse, they discovered some tunnels underneath it where slaves would hide as they were running away. See, you did not walk away from being a slave. You could be sold into slavery. You could be captured and put into slavery. There were different ways that you could be put into slavery. One of the ways in the scriptures was you could sell yourself into slavery. If you had too much debt, you could sell yourself. And if you were a slave, if you'd done that, you could continue to be a slave forever for that person. We sing a song, Pierce My Ear, O Lord my God. Well, where does that come from? What? It's kind of a neat thing. I'm going to read from Exodus. Exodus chapter 21, verses 5 and 6. It says, But if the servant declares... 
I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then the master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. And he will be his servant for life. So I don't care if you slave, I don't care if you servant. What we're doing in just to that song and that passage is we are taking ourselves and we are saying, I am yours for life. God, you are my master. Ah, well, really do we want that? If you claim to be a Christian, a disciple, that is what you are saying. You're attaching yourself to your master, who is God. You're doing what your master wants, not what you want. We struggle with that. We have other masters that come along. It's usually self. We need to strive to make sure we are serving our heavenly master. Our goal for our life should be him to be our master and us doing what he desires. Well, why? Well, it goes back to the idea we've been sanctified. We've been made right through his love, through Christ's love, when he died on that cross. Acts 2.38 it's a passage we look at a lot. And it talks about making that commitment to Christ, being baptized, having your sins washed away, and being right. And we go back to the idea of sins washed away. Bathed in Christ, we're clean. Well, what is just before that? Well, I want to read in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. It says, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Repent, be baptized. Well, okay, well, what were they cut to the heart for? Well, well, let's step back another verse. Verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Master. They crucified our Lord. Maybe they were in the crowd shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Maybe they were just passively letting it happen. It didn't matter. Their sins are what put Jesus on that cross, not the Roman government, not the Jewish leaders. Their sins put him on a cross. You put him on that cross. And he went willingly because he loves you so much. He went through physical and mental anguish. Three times he asked God, could he take it away? But he went through it. Because he loves me. What must I do? It's an easy answer. Commit our lives to Christ. Commit to Christ. To commit to God as Master, as our Lord. That's why we're sanctified. To have Him as Lord. We strive then to be selfless. To, to have our ears pierced, not for ornamental but to show whose we are. I'm yours. I'm a slave for life, God. You are my master. Mother's Day is a great time to talk about this because it's all bathed in God's love. And is there a greater love than a mother's love? What does a mother give up? Does a sacrifice for their family? Take some time this day and thank mom appreciate her for what she's done. Moms are a great example of God's love for us. And then how are we going to respond to that? This week, when you see a hat, notice the hat. I like to read the hats. Some of them are kind of interesting. But look beyond the hat. Look under the hat. Use it as a reminder to live as a disciple sanctified, made right with God as you strive to be selfless. Why? Because we've become a slave. And we're about our master's business. But we're not alone. We have each other. We talked about that last week when we used the word partners. When you see a hat, think about being sanctified. Think about being selfless. Think about being a slave.
Stay safe. I love you.